Welcome to episode 18 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's the small hours of Saturday the 8th of November and I'm here with Alan, Dave and Laura. Um, Alan, what have you been up to the last couple of weeks? We, I went to the um, Ubuntu release party. Oh, and how was that? Yeah, it was good fun. It was at um, uh, a pub in London, Waxy O'Connor's, I think it was. Waxy O'Connor's. Waxy O'Connor's, yes, yeah, traditional Irish pub. I did drink Guinness all night. Lots it's of people not, there? Yeah, there was, uh, there was. it was really busy, actually. It was loads of um, canonical people there, loads of launch pads. I think there was like 30 launch pad pe- developers there. <laughs> well, what are they like, celebrating? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, loads of loads of other canonical people, uh, community people as well. Loads of um, friends turned up, and at one point there was this couple who walked over and said, "What's all this then?" And they spent about forty five minutes to an hour talking to us about a bunch of, or listening to us talk to them about a bunch of, asking like sensible questions. And uh, at the end of the evening, I happened to uh, grab hold of one of the um, canonical guys and take his very last uh, <laughs> CD off of him, and then run around the pub trying to find this woman and then hand her the cd because i didn't have one on my person at the time but yeah and, and then she said why won't these guys just leave us alone <laughs> just quiet night out. <laughs> I, honestly i thought she would walk away at some point but she actually just stood there and listened to us talk about it it was quite interesting mark shuttleworth was there as well and we had a um a bit of a chat about desktop stuff and um yeah i'm sure we'll talk to him more when we go to uds next release i highly recommend that other people go to a release party near them because it's good fun a good way to get in touch with other people in the ubuntu community was the london one the only uk based one the only formal one yeah the only formally organized one yeah but, I mean, you could have a release party sat in the bath. Yeah, absolutely. You, you could have, have your re- release party sat at the end of your neighbour's drive, <laughs> leeching their Wi-Fi. Oh, fine. <laughs> what have you been up to the last couple of weeks, Dave? You moved house, didn't you? Yes, yeah. I mean, you uh, haven't got Wi-Fi at home, have you, Dave? Yeah, I mean, over the last uh, two weeks, I've been moving down to the backwaters of nowhere. Yep. And um, I've been surviving on internet speed slower than dial-up. Oh, oh dear. Lovely. Actually, I did notice when I gave you a URL earlier on, and you kept telling me to wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you hadn't got it yet. <laughs> That's so sad. Are you actually having to use things like Opera Mini just to be able to? Look at it? <laughs> actually, I mean, for the real geek, I've been using SSH with maximum compression, setting up a Sox proxy to just to try and speed up by tunneling my web traffic. Laura, what about you? Um, I've convinced three people in the past week to listen to the podcast. Excellent. Which is Excellent. pretty good. Um, we've run out of stickers to give them though, so I had to sort of write it down for them the url yeah um, specifically they wanted to get a, f- a cheap viglin but i made them listen to the episode so hopefully they'll listen again we gave out about 400 uh, stickers or so and the best part of 100 cds promotional limited edition ubuntu uk podcast cds at the expo so if you weren't at the expo you missed out on those yeah and we haven't had any complaints about the cds yet no we? no it's it's just, just the email address to work <laughs> <laughs> That's because they just wipe everybody's PC when they install <laughs> no, no. well, we it. We did remove unnecessary software. Unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, we do no, yeah. <laughs> And the kernel. Yeah. No, it was a special customised version of the 804 installer that Alan did, and it had a podcast on the desktop and a podcast wallpaper, and we had to remove a couple of bits of software that nobody uses, like the GIMP. So, Tony, what have you been up to in the last couple of weeks since the expo? I've been upgrading my Myth TV box to... Uh, hardy actually and then trying to fix all the bits that broke yeah i've seen your stress on the uh, irc recently and twitter (laughs) yeah it's just about there there's a few little glitches but i'm not too sure there's actually anything what doesn't work playing back recordings hey who needs that anyway that's overrated yeah Yeah. overrated are these are these ubuntu issues or myth issues or what i don't know i don't think it's actually a consistent bug i think it's some little strange transient problem and you've also been playing with um yeah i've also been trying to get a separate front end and back end working so we've been given a, a little sort of small form factor fanless box to review which we'll review in an upcoming episode but i've been trying to get it to work as a front end so that you can have a silent box in the front room and have the back end up in the loft or somewhere like that um, with the fans and the noisy bits and all the data storage and i've had some success with it so we'll watch out for that review it'll be coming in a future episode so what have we got in the show today we've got a discussion about our experiences of upgrading to ubuntu 8.10 We review an Ubuntu Kung Fu book. And we set another competition. We discuss about what we like in our perfect Ubuntu setup and how we get there. We have some listener feedback. And the news. Sounds like a fun-packed show. Now, as we all know, Intrepid Ibex has just been released. I did an upgrade during the week. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I just changed the gutsy in my sources list to Hardy. And then I... um, Hardy? What? What? 
Oh, Why are you dear. looking at me? Yes. But no, Hardy's great. I mean, now I've got the upgrade done. Um, Myth TV's running on it reasonably well. A few little bugs here and there, but and, um, I'm really pleased with Hardy. I think I think it's a successful release. Well done, everybody. Well done yeah. to the Ubuntu community. Yeah, uh, I think you might be a bit out of date there, Tony. We've all <laughs> we've all moved on. What, Keep what up mean? at the back. <laughs> what do you mean? We're all on eight ten. Yeah, eight. T- ten. Oh, these numbers mean nothing to me. Uh, yep. A lot of people say, where on earth do these oddball numbers come from? Okay, so we've got 8.10. So what that's actually saying is, is it's 2008 and it's the 10th month release. So what was Hardy, Tony? Uh, 8.04. Which would mean? 2008 and it's the fourth month. Yeah. And presumably 8.04.1 was released on the first day uh, of no, the... No, no. Yeah, you look <laughs> no. That's, where, that's, it, that's where it all goes wrong. Yeah. Oh, I just don't understand it. But anyway, so those of you who have actually updated to what is apparently the latest, greatest uh, version of Ubuntu, Intrepid. Some people actually don't think it's the greatest. There's been a lot of comments that it's actually a bit of a... Mm, yeah, meh. A bit of a meh release. Not mm. a lot in it that's... You know, Mehi well, hang on. To be fair, when you're releasing every six months, you can't expect huge, great, big changes. Some people do. With Ubuntu being so popular and you know being the like the poster child of Linux at the moment, people think every six months there should be something fantastic and new. And yeah, I mean, in many ways, I can agree with that. But I would also say, look at any commercial other operating systems and uh, ask to see what changes happen there every six months. I mean, true, true. And under the cover changes are also good. I'm running eight ten, and there are some features that you know I've noticed. But yeah, there isn't there isn't that much. There isn't a compelling you know you absolutely must get it because okay, there's two things that you probably you might want to get it for. One's three G support, so Network Manager you can now use your three G dongle and stuff. But can you use your mobile over Bluetooth at all using uh, using Network Manager? I don't think you can. You no. can't. You still have to pull back to command line options. Yeah. That is a bit rubbish. Okay, and there was one other thing that I saw in um, 8.10 that I would use, and that is um, we have a computer in the kitchen, and sometimes people come round and they want to use my computer, but I don't want them using my account or Claire's account, so there's this guest account yeah. thing. I mean, you don't want just you know guests seeing what rude websites you've been looking at, do you? Well, it's more that I don't want them opening up the browser and seeing the default page, which is my email. <laughs> you know, or you know, it Claire's, which is going to her online shopping and stuff like that. If you know, if people want to come around and they want to surf the web or get their email or whatever, they can just use guest account and then it throws it all away when they log out. Um, I hear there is a new wallpaper. Someone told me it looked like a cave painting, and actually couldn't figure out what on earth it was. It's a bit mystical, isn't it? Well, I so, quite I think, like it. I think something you're looking at quite a lot should maybe make you think a bit. I mean, it's just. Pretty boring. Though. You make me think a bit, though. <laughs> and we to look at you. you I know. Lots. I know when you're sat on your own and you're thinking of Davy. You're thinking. I have you on my wallpaper. That's <laughs> That's right. Right. Yeah. It makes me think. About <laughs> what didn't we get that we we thought we might? Well, apparently the netbook support is still a bit flaky here and there. Some of the netbook stuff doesn't just work. Yeah, there's still um, network driver issues, but I think that's being fixed in. Later, the next things. release no 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 um a uh, new kernel package oh, it's right, got okay. the, the newer atheros driver because a lot of the netbooks have this atheros network card i mean i've been looking at my options for a netbook i quite fancy getting one if i can stretch to it and uh, i was looking at the acer aspire one and there's a list of things that don't work of it work on it out of the box on intrepid and it's still quite a long list there's still quite a, a long list of things you have to what, tweak manually what kind of stuff like sound acpi the yeah. buttons yeah or like yeah. the usual kind of stuff yeah yeah <laughs> right oh. um i suspect x work and that's probably about it one thing that it missed was um open office uh, version three yeah. yeah it's a bit of a disappointment i mean because it came out sort of what was it about two three weeks before release or so and it, it just didn't make it in which is a bit of a shame really yeah. so will that not come in until next release now yeah, yeah. Or you can get it. Well, you'll probably be, be able to get it backported. I mean, you're right. I mean, it may well not come into Intrepid, and that would be a shame because there are some funky things in mm. Open Office three, like that. What's that thing where you can do the um, split screen? So if you're doing like These a presentation, presenter mode, presenter mode. Yeah. So you've got like if you've got two screens plugged in, you've got oh, like a projector. Do not get me started about presenter mode. It allows you to have. Imagine you're standing on a podium and you've got your laptop in front of you mm. and you've got the big screen behind you oh, so like and you're plugged into a projector. You can see on your laptop the next slide and your notes whilst on the big projector screen you, you have full screen the current slide. So how many of you actually upgraded? Have we all, have we all upgraded to 810? Uh, I haven't actually upgraded. I mean, I've got it on one computer that I've been running for a few weeks and I haven't, you know, so basically that's out of the question. And because I haven't had decent reliable broadband for the last week i haven't upgraded my laptop it, no it was bath night <laughs> i installed 
the Intrepid at the Alpha, so I've been upgrading right through, and so I think I've just installed the last updates today. I had um, my laptop running. Uh, I upgraded to... Uh, I was on 64-bit Hardy, and I upgraded to 64-bit Intrepid uh, 810 early in the like alpha beta stage, and I was upgrading all the way through. And then when it went live, it was like, okay, so now I've got the final release. <laughs> and that was, that was it. But I thought there were a few weird things, like there was the stuff kicking around on my system from the beta that should have been removed. Like the, in fact, funnily enough, the cruft remover I've, tool I've, <laughs> that, that should have been removed wasn't. I've just it's, run the cruft remover tool and it's just got rid of some cruft no, for me. The, the cruft remover tool, that was renamed from something else, wasn't it? Uh, uh I can't remember actually. It, there, there's talk about renaming it again. Again? Yeah, because Cruft is not a. I I asked two guys at work what Cruft meant, and one of them said I've got no idea, and he's like an expert in languages, he speaks Chinese and French and German. And I said, "What do you think Cruft means?" And he, he said, "I've got no idea." Clearly, so, doesn't speak geek though. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I asked the other guy, and he said, "Is it something to do with dogs?" Uh, so talking about things we didn't necessarily expect to be in there. Uh, if you actually SSH remote logged in to an yes. box. Yeah. What do you think about that? People don't know what we're talking about. I don't know. I it's, don't know what you're uh, talking about. It's the landscape stats that come up when you when you first log in. Oh right. If and you it, if you log in you get a mess you know the message of the day that gives you yeah. the copyright and everything. After it there's like what your CPU utilization currently is, memory and which is really other. good. Yeah, well I, I think it's a nice little feature, but there's a line under that, isn't there? The line under it that says basically if you want, you know, to be able to monitor this remotely or something, then you might want to go to landscape.canonical.com. So um, it's uh, an in-line advertising. Yeah, which is a paid-for service, isn't it? Yeah, in fact, I've noticed a couple of things. There's that. And if you look at the cover of the new uh, 810 CD, if you look on the back of the CD, it actually advertises shop.ubuntu.com and shop.canonical.com. Yeah, it's got uh, to buy world-class support and training for Ubuntu and official merchandise and software. Please visit shop.canonical.com. And that's where you can get your DB2 license from, isn't it? Yeah, yeah right. two thousand pounds or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I mean it's, it's I, fair I enough. They're, they're paying for the CDs. Well, yeah. actually, if you're buying them, you're paying for the CDs. But you know, they're they're producing the CDs. It's not that intrusive. Yeah, I, I, I was had mixed feelings about both the the message of the day thing that they mentioned and that. And then I thought, well, you know, they are bankrolling this whole operation, so maybe we should cut them some. It would be more annoying if it said you can buy landscape after every command that you ran. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> buy landscape, buy landscape, buy landscape. Yeah. And every time you type sudo, it says you can also get support. <laughs> oh, the encrypted private folder. That's another new thing. Mm. Do you think many people are really going to use that? Encry- basically, the, um, there's this, you can, it's not on by default, but it's available. You install a package and then you run some stuff and you end up with a folder called private or whatever you want to call it in your home directory and anything you put in there is encrypted. Now, this is something Dustin Kirkland was really keen about, the last UDS and FOSCAB. He talked about it both, didn't he? Mm. Mm. There was a, uh, an open week session about it as well, I think. Yeah. It's a nice feature, and you know, I can see how some people might find it useful. And in fact, I did set it up on my desktop PC during the beta phase of, of 8.10, and I've completely forgotten about it. And yeah. it's, it works. My email is all in there, and my SSH keys and loads yeah, of other stuff. Yeah, because because what what people are doing is uh, because you've only got one folder inside your home directory where everything in there is encrypted. Uh, obviously, you need things elsewhere on your file system. Like if you use SSH keys and, and what you've already mentioned, you think, well, hang on, I can't put them in there as well as have them where I need them. So what they're doing is they're putting them inside the encrypted directory and then having symlinks or shortcuts. To um, to where they actually belong on the file system. Yeah, that's exactly what that I makes do. sense. Yeah, and it it took a while actually to copy the files because I've got all my email downloaded locally. When I dragged my dot evolution folder into the private folder, it took some time sure. because obviously it's got to encrypt all that. And you've got to shed data. loads of email. Yeah, um, and presumably the the main application is for people who've got laptops. It's the, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, when yeah. you've got your military secrets in there, and you can leave the laptop on the train and not worry about it. So, are you happy with eight ten? It doesn't seem that much different to me, and it might be because I installed it at the alpha level, and it just wasn't that exciting on release day because there was nothing. It wasn't you, like a big deal, there, there nothing is. broke or anything. There's a new book just been released called Ubuntu Kung Fu by. Kung, Kung Fu. Fu. Well, let's go to the pronunciation expert, Dave. How would you say it? <laughs> Kung Fu. Ubuntu Kung Fu, and it's by Kia Thomas. 
Yep. And we've uh, got a review copy. So what's in it? Uh, it's got two main sections. There's a, a, a kind of introduction to Ubuntu and a kind of general setup and getting yourself up and running. And then the main bulk of the book is th- over 300 tips. But they're not, they're not just, they're not a short tip, like, you know, here's how you maximize a window or something yeah, like that. Yeah, because I, I imagine they'd be like little one-liners, mm. but they're actually like com- Com- most, comprehensive. And it's most of a page or more for they're each like, tip. They're like mini how-tos, really, more than, more than tips. They're pretty good. What yeah. sort of range of things do they cover? Oh, everything from like media and uh, installing all the, the necessary bits and bobs and, you mm. know, com- reconfiguring stuff, tuning the boot up, that kind of stuff. There were certainly things now I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And it's things you wouldn't necessarily normally come across on Google. You might find it on like the Ubuntu planet or something where someone's pointed it out. The thing about it is it's one of these books where you, you don't have a set of chapters where you you know read a chapter and now I know everything about networking or read a chapter and now I know all about printing. It's kind of like a big mash of you know these little mini how-tos. Uh, when I actually first opened it, I thought, hey, there are some really good things here, but it's not something I could sit down and read because it has got some um, intro stuff. So I think if I had come from maybe... From a Why? Mac or a Windows background, I think I'll probably get into it a bit more. That there is a, a section on what aptitude is. Right. And I think, well, you know, I know what aptitude well, is. Well, yeah, but we're not target audience, are we? So. Well, uh, that's well, what that's well, that, that's, that's my point. Well, what is the target audience? I mean, there seems to be some command line stuff in there and quite a lot of GUI stuff. And yeah, there's actually command line stuff pretty early on in the book as well. Mm. They don't seem to go in any particular order of difficulty or anything like that. They seem quite mixed up. Yeah. I mean, there was one about halfway through, which was how to find what version of GNOME you're running, which is click system and then click about, about GNOME. GNOME. Yeah. And it tells you what version it is. And that was kind of halfway through the book. And you can't get any easier than that, really. If you mix them up, then it's something yeah. that you can just dip in and get a tip and go, oh, that's great. You know, if that was just sat on the coffee table and mm-hmm. you picked it up and flicked through, there's next to each tip, there's a little box, a little empty square box. And the idea being, you, if you see something in there you like, you might not be sat at your PC. It's something you can pick up off the coffee table and tick the little box. Okay. Go, ah, right. Yeah. Must remember to try that or do that or, you know, have a play with that when mm. I get back to my PC. Okay. Let's try this book out. Let's pick a random page and see what tips are on there. Um, Laura, what page number? Um, 130. Okay. What's on page 130 then? It's going to be a, this page is intentionally <laughs> left blank. <laughs> Scanning for viruses. Okay. <laughs> Something every Linux user needs to do. <laughs> okay, it tells how to do that. You can do a full system scan and how that can be very disk intensive. It talks about Clam TK, what Clam TK won't scan, such as things in the proc di- uh, slash proc directory, and what happens if Clam TK finds a virus and how it quarantines it. Okay, be useful. Dave? Someone coming from Windows? Uh, yeah. Dave, throw a page number out. Okay, let's go for page 385. Yeah, that doesn't exist. It doesn't go up that far. 367. And the last 10 pages of that are index. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's go for... Okay, I'm going to go for 360. 360. This is going to be the thank yous page, isn't it? Yep, beginning of the index. (laughs) (laughs) Fail. Right, okay, I'm going to pick... 287. Okay. I think we're onto a winner there. I think yeah, we that's got to be a winner. It's how to always know your IP address. Oh man, that's something that really bugs me. Yeah, I always want to know my IP address. I, I think I know how to tell that, but go on, what does the book say? It says, for example, you could right click Network Manager, select connection information in the menu that appears, and look for the IP address in the list. That works. At a command line, you can type ifconfig and look for the init address line. Or grep. No, that tip isn't in there. That, no, that's not in there. <laughs> <laughs> that actually works. I've just done the network manager thing. I've just done it. Oh, wow. Cool. So you've learned something there, Tony. <laughs> yeah, and it tells me my um, DNS servers and subnet mask and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, and what's your public IP address, Tony? Not on here because it's not a public IP address. It does say that you might come across limitations if you're behind a NAT router. Hey. Mm. Um, and what you actually see if you do it behind a NAT router. And then there's a solution called Giplet which you can install using Synaptic. and Sorry, can you can spell that, Laura? G-I-P-L-E-T. And this will ensure that your external IP address is, is displayed. Oh, See, right. that is a useful tip. That yeah. really is. Okay, tell okay. me. Um, all right, I will go for page 83. It's part of configuring Ubuntu's firewall and how okay. to configure incoming connections mm. using Firestarter and clicking the policy tab and ensuring inbound traffic policies selected and that kind of thing. And how many pages does it devote to talking about firewall? Uh, there? 
from page 82 to T6. Okay, that's pretty good. A few pages. And yeah. is it all using Firestarter or is it, does it talk about UFW, the Ubuntu firewall thing? Or IP tables? It seems to be Firestarter all the way through with an introductory bit. All right, fair enough. Cool. Alan, pick a number. Uh, He's got his thinking head on, look. He's sweating. Oh, man. Uh, 193. That's a rubbish number. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say 192, but you might think I was getting inspired by IP addresses. (laughs) Okay, on 193, there are two tips. Uh, One is removing the annoying delay when installing Firefox extensions. Oh, what annoying delay is that? You know, when you you click on an add-on, on a website, it pops up in a box, and then the install thing is greyed out for five seconds. You have seconds. to hover three, over it, don't three you? Three seconds. I, I actually do find that annoying. I mean, that is wasted at least a minute of my life. Three seconds. Well, no, cumulatively. I mean, Dave... Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right, fair enough. Depends <laughs> you, how many you're installing. To be fair, it's not a minute you'd have done much with. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's a minute I'll never get back. Yeah. Apparently, this, is, this delay is there for a good reason. It's to ensure you don't just click automatically without first reading what the dialogue box yeah. says you're but about to install. But we all to you do just, that. No, you just stare at the install button until it stops yeah. being read out, and you press it. You don't read anything but the install button. But... You can go about colon config in Firefox's address bar and click the I'll be careful, I promise button. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> then in the filter text area, type type something and double click the entry under the value heading and change it to the delay. That and then you that just goes away. So you could set it to a full minute delay. I'd love to you do that could. on someone else. Oh, oh yeah. man, I was at that an hour. That's, that's <laughs> worth getting. When somebody lends you their, their laptop so you can just check your email. Or See, something. this is what the guest account is for. Yeah. Stop people doing that. Okay, what was the other tip on that page? Oh, um, The other one was to view technical details of your PC's hardware. Okay. Um, How does it do that? LSHW or... LSPCI? It says Norm Device Manager used to be a standard feature of Ubuntu, but for some reason isn't any longer, so you can still install it using Synaptic. Oh, okay. And I think that's that's the way it's talking about going. All the things we've selected seem some, to be you know, reasonably geeky. Yeah. People are quite into their computers. And there are some fairly non-geeky things like how to install MS Comic Sans oh, and yeah. other Windows fonts. Yep. Mm. Um, what about Windings? <laughs> I think that comes under the Windows Microsoft fonts. Two that have just caught my attention. One's turning off the beep, the system beep, if it really irritates you. That is annoying. And another one, add drop shadows to screenshots. Because you can. Yeah, that's handy. Uh. So is it something you, you think you'd recommend to a new user? Say, no. say really? It's not something you give to no. your mother-in-law, is it? Just flicking through it now, even though there are some easy things in it, they're so mixed up that you can't even say, go read this section of the book. It would benefit from having a, a section for you know beginners, a section on packaging, a section on audio and video or something. I or... think so, yeah. I, I think I might have potential to give this to someone who's reasonably geeky but it's yeah. very new to Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. someone who knows Windows and is a techie person, maybe. Yeah, if you're a sort of a power user or something on Windows. Then, yeah, I think they'd find it particularly useful. Yeah. It's the sort of book that you're only ever going to get use out of a small proportion of the tips, Yes, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah it depends on your level again. You know, if you're if yeah. you're a real beginner, then there's going to be an awful lot in there that you won't know. And you can also yeah. get it in PDF format. Oh, right, okay. You can buy it online uh, from the website, UbuntuKungFu.com. Mm. And there's a link there to buy it in PDF form. I think it's $22, which is really cheap. And I saw well, it on Amazon really cheap. As yeah, well. I mean, you can't even say how much $22 is because by the time this actually comes to press. <laughs> <laughs> but the Dead Tree version is available for about 16 quid, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cheap. It's on Amazon.co.uk mm. and, and the Pragmatic Programmers Bookstore, I think, is, mm. the, uh, is the main website. And I think at that price, it's worth it. And I know it's quite girly, but the kitten on the front is kind of cute. Yeah, it's got, it's got a kitten doing kung fu, hasn't it's a ninja it? Ninja kitten. Yeah, yeah it's quite cute actually. You'll find yeah. it on the website as well. Yeah, it's not just girly then. The, the, no, it's definitely <laughs> kittens are cute. I can't help it. Yeah, which is why our, our cat here has turned up to just be part of this review. What do we think if we if we had to rate this book like you know out of five? Three and a half. Okay, Dave. I, I think I'll just give it a thumbs up. Dave doesn't want to be pinned down to anything as precise as one to well, five. Okay, I mean, you know. Uh, well, I'd say that's five then. Four, four. I guess four. Yeah, Laura. Yeah, three and a half. I'd give it a four myself. So we're looking three and a half, four, something like that. Three point seven five. Okay, so I mean, they actually gave us this book as a review copy. Um, so should we? Uh, should yeah. we give it away in a competition? I think we should. Yeah, we like it so much, we'll give it away. <laughs> yeah. It was that good. And so the question we're going to set is: How many tips are there in the book? 
exactly how exactly many. How many. Um, if there's nobody that gets it exactly right, then we'll, we'll take the nearest correct answers. Um, if everybody gets it exactly right, then we'll draw the names out of a hat. OK, so get your entries in by Wednesday the 19th of November. And uh, we'll post it to you, and please don't live any further away than the UK. <laughs> but if you do, we will post it to you. Uh, and where should we send the entries to? Well, we, we won't send, we them, won't to send them anywhere, but listeners can send them to competition at ubuntu-uk.org. Codeweavers got carried away with Obama mania and decided to give their crossover Office software for free, allowing people to run Microsoft Office on Linux. Just like wine, really. The Linux community surprised itself with fevered attempts to download the proprietary software, which melted the Codeweavers servers. That was quite funny, actually. Yeah, you wouldn't have thought people would be that keen to get proprietary software on Linux, It's free stuff, isn't it? Yeah, but to be fair, did you also download the Mac version as well? No. Oh, I did. <laughs> Why would you do that? Do you even have a Mac? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we can blame you. Actually, I did download it and I installed it. And I, I, it's quite polished. It's quite nice. You know, you install the GUI and it gives you a list of app, Windows applications that it supports. And I scrolled down through the entire list and went, nope, 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 nope. And there's not one thing in there that I actually require. Uh, no, no, but you can also use it to install unsupported things, which do work really well as well. Yeah, sure. Mark Shuttleworth said in an interview that he didn't think anyone could make money from the Linux desktop, which is handy as he's got lots. Otherwise, we'd see him by the exit door at an expo rattling a tin. I can see why a lot of people jumped on this. You know, the, the fact that he's commented and people are saying, oh my God, if he's not, not going to make any money, surely he's not going to carry on. What he's saying is they're not, not going to make money by selling box sets of Ubuntu. They're going no, to make it, it from services and support. Equally, he also said that he thinks that Canonical could turn a profit from the server product within two to three years. Yeah, the amount they charge for support, I'm not surprised. Hey! hey. The guys over at Pharonix have done some benchmarking to compare the performance of Ubuntu 704, 710, 804, and the most recent 810. In their tests, Pharonix highlighted some surprising differences in performance between recent versions of Ubuntu. In 804 and 810, for example, MP3 encoding took double the amount of time than in earlier releases and slower than other distros like Fedora. With developers levelling some of the blame at conservative optimizations in GCC and changes in kernel configuration, the analysis continues. It's a little bit of a worry, isn't it? Because one of the things we, we tell people about Ubuntu is that it's quite performant. Yeah, and that it doesn't get slower over time and that you know new releases don't mean you have to upgrade all the memory in your machine. And, and you don't have to reinstall to get a, a nice, fresh, fast desktop install every six months like you do with Windows. But the good thing is the developers have been talking about this on one of the developer mailing lists and they are looking at it and they're you know being totally open and they're not dismissing this as you know not true. It's, it's I suppose worked on. the flip side is you don't have to do a, an install every six months to get a faster desktop. You get an install every six months to do a slower desktop. Google's Android requires you to use Ubuntu to build the source files on Linux. This isn't strictly true. They do say there's no reason why you can't build it on non-Ubuntu systems. I mean, like anyone who tries to let them know how it goes. So is this a byproduct of Google using Ubuntu internally? Perhaps? Yeah, presumably the Android team are using Ubuntu to develop Or Gubuntu. Don't they have their own internal release? They have multiple different distros internally. Yeah, I but I, I think they actually do build their own custom ISO, don't they? The uh, website just says that they test on Ubuntu. I'm not sure whether we can confirm that, and there's a black helicopter just going. <laughs> <laughs> Kulu.com has announced that they'll be selling the OpenMoco free runner with Android pre installed beginning in November 2008, as well as offering free downloads of the free runner port of Android to existing free runner owners. If you're comparing Google. Um, the G1, the, the Google G1 phone, the, the which um, has just come out, HTC, yeah, with the free runner, then the Google phone has you know better hardware in some ways. It's got a keyboard for a start, and the free runner doesn't, mm -hmm. and 3G, and the free runner doesn't. Uh, but does Android have that nifty padlock thing? Well, you can write one to make it oh, <laughs> it's yeah. open source and make yeah. your own. The Ubuntu shop from Canonical released a limited edition commemorative t-shirt to celebrate the release of Intrepid Ibex. They were designed in an arguably awkward colour of lime green. Within 24 hours, they were removed from the virtual shelves. It is thought that the colour was the reason for this. 
insert joke about brown. Do you mean like Gordon Brown? Oh no, I meant about colours, not people not liking colours brown. So have any of you got any of these t-shirts? No, it looked like a sort of accident in a mushy pea factory. There's a lot of green and brown going on. I, I thought it was a snot. I drunkenly ordered three of them <laughs> <laughs> within the 24 hour period before they went uh, before they disappeared. And would you wear them? Uh, they're still in their plastic bags, actually. They've been delivered, and I'm not not sure I will, actually. Is it coincidence they were delivered on Halloween? (laughs) (laughs) Nubuntu, the distro for the security aware, had its alpha release at the end of October. Its website, nubuntu.org, says it's derived from Ubuntu, but with unnecessary packages removed. Things like no open office (laughs) and evolution. (laughs) And (laughs) And the networking stack. (laughs) <laughs> to be fair, it's aimed at security testing and they're less concerned with people using it than in learning how to produce the distro, I think, and how to set up security testing. The Aegis project has announced 12.6 million euro investment in accessibility, with a vast majority of it focused on open source solutions. The Aegis project is a consortium of 20 partners representing which of the leading expertise of accessibility from industry disability organisations and university and commercial research organisations. I think it includes companies like Sun um, at the, ha- the bigger end of the industry. Uh, one of our listeners, Ian Pascoe, emailed in to say that Ubuntu is the only current distro that has accessibility functionality built into its live CD to enable visually impaired users to benefit from Ubuntu from the very, very beginning of either installation or running the live CD. That's really cool. That is really Excellent. cool. Uh, on um, Planet Ubuntu, uh, there's been a few people who've uh, started a little meme, which is, uh, what do you do to your machine immediately after an install? Like the post-install stuff you do to get the perfect setup or your, you know, have your setup sweet, you know, exactly as you want. And I just wondered what you guys do, whether you use any tools like, um, okay, I'm going to mention their names, but I would recommend that nobody uses them, Automatics or Ultimatics or... <laughs> Or something like Tweak or some other script or something, or do you just like add stuff when you need it or what? What, what do you do, Laura? What do they do? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, That'd be a no, but what do they do? Well, Automatics and uh, Ultimax, Ultimatics is a derivative of Automatics, and they've been around a while. And the purpose that they were supposed to serve was to make it easy to install stuff on Ubuntu, like, you know, if you wanted drivers for your video card and and things uh, that aren't included like skype they're not in the repository yeah so and they? other applications yeah okay. other third-party applications and stuff that's actually in the repo but just make it nice and easy to find it and stuff but it failed quite badly in the way it was the people communicated in the community and there was a lot of bad blood and feeling about it and and a new version that's come out automatics which um if you visit matthew garrett's blog which isn't always um, family friendly, uh, as, a, <laughs> as a minor warning. Uh, it's mjg59 at livejournal.com. He, get, he, he has had an in depth review of both of them. And okay. basically, the short answer is don't use them. No. So, what were some of the problems that he found? Uh, they're quite lengthy, actually, but lots of them like bad packaging, uh, executing commands that would override situations that the packaging system is trying to protect you from. Right. But, yeah. like but before you, I mean, you know, did he actually walk into this with an un, unbiased viewpoint, considering the slating he gave its predecessor somewhat a year ago? Whether he's biased or not, all you've got to do is look at the code. <laughs> and if you look at the code, it isn't nice. I mean, really. I mean, I'm not a coder, and I've looked at it, and it's not nice. So anyway, that's what they are. And people can make their own judgment on them by reading the code. But... um yeah, I just wondered what you guys do use. If you don't use that, what do you use? What do you do after you install? After I install, I look for the email client and the web browser I'd normally use, realise that the email client isn't there by default, and install it and do the same absolutely every time. So you, you have like packages that you, you know you like, mm. like uh, Thunderbird? Uh, Thunderbird, Thunderbird? Yeah. Right. So you don't like Evolution, you like Thunderbird. Yeah. So immediately after installing, I install Thunderbird. you install Thunderbird. Anything else that um, comes to mind? Or is it... Do you kind of do it piecemeal? Yeah, when I discover when I don't need... have it and I thought I had it and then I remember Sorry. that I haven't oh, damn, installed I need... it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's really annoying. Actually. It's one of the advantages of having a local mirror is that you can get it all really quickly, though. Unless, no. unless she's at work or somewhere yeah. or out well, somewhere, and yeah, beyond my control. <laughs> <laughs> you should you should get her a three G card and VPN access to home, which you can do with free software apparently. Yeah, network manager. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think one of the things I like to install is Terminator, which is the uh, the console utility where you can actually split mm-hmm. the actual. Um, mm. Split, split it up yeah. into multiple sections. Yeah, we interviewed Chris Jones about yeah. it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, is that it? Is it you just install everything and then you install Terminator and that gets you set forever? No, <laughs> no. Does anybody here actually use any of these automatics or similar products to get loads no. of proprietary stuff? I, I have tried automatics a long time ago. I did test it, I, yeah. I didn't really have any quibbles with it, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but the problem is, it's one of those things that you don't have a problem with it if you Until just it run breaks. it. You don't, yeah, exactly. When it breaks, six months down the line when you try and do an upgrade, or a year down the line when you try and do an upgrade, it's then that you find out, and then someone tells you it's because you used automatics two years ago. You know, it's very hard, but hard pill to swallow. <laughs> I must admit, I've never felt the need to use any of those sort of things. Yeah. I mean, I, how often I've, do you reinstall though? Well, very, very rarely, I guess. But I don't need the things that it it provides. Codex video drivers. Well, codex stuff. There's the codex buddy thing that gets it for me and seems doesn't to get do a good everything enough job. Though. It doesn't seem to give me any problems. Um, maybe I'm just lucky. But you um, don't install Flash, do you, or Java or anything like that? No, I tend to use the free Flash, the Ganache. Um, okay. But I, you know, all the bits and the proprietary stuff that it gets, I don't tend to use. So I've never I, really felt the need to get them. I do use them. And it's just a pain when I discover I don't have them. So I go onto Facebook and try and look at somebody's photos or video or something. Don't have Flash. Go and find telling Flash. telling you something there. Maybe you shouldn't be using <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> yeah. No. Says the bloke who has a Facebook profile. Yeah. And then, you know, got somewhere that needs Java. I've started to keep a note of um, I having done a few installs for testing purposes. And, you know, because I've got a couple of laptops and a desktop and I've reinstalled a few times. I've kept these notes now of what I do post install and actually it's only three lines that hmm. i do and those three lines give me pretty much every application i need i mean uh, there's one meta package i always like to install is uh, build essential to help you compile stuff and a lot of other programming tools and some other remote uh, um some sysas admin tools and such and those are in the repo anyway oh, so yeah, it's yeah. one line to get yeah. all of those in one go so that's nice and easy i found on my wiki the list of packages that i install on, on a fresh install which are command line tools so it tends to be for servers but they're things that keep me happy and some of them are now in the standard install anyway but they weren't uh, they weren't originally uh, which is ssh yeah L- <laughs> <laughs> nobody's excited about it yeah, except Tony. Get in there. yes Get in there. uh lsof so lists open files what e-links so the command line web browser. Text-based browser. Text-based browser, you see, yeah. You see why ah. I leave him to do the sysadmin stuff? Jeez. Yes. <laughs> he actually You're living on the it. edge. W3M <laughs> is being dropped from uh, the server edition, isn't it, man? Who cares? What do you guys like? Screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah screen. We um, all love screen. And back in the days when there wasn't an NTP server installed by default, I installed one of those. And N- oh, a time server, so, okay. Yeah. And unzip. Okay. And, but do you not run a graphical environment on your PC? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, my PC, on my PCs, I do. But you know, this is a little list of things that when I get a new, fresh server installed, these are the tools that I install to make it make make me happy um, and that, you know, that I use on a fairly regular basis. Setting up Linux machines is so much nicer than setting up Windows machines. Oh, totally. Because I used to trash my Windows machine at work quite frequently mm. <laughs> somehow and then get a CD and start from scratch and do it myself. And it'd be two weeks before I'd found everything because every time you find an application, you've got to go and find the setup file. Just doing a synaptic is absolutely fantastic. And that, I can be up and mm, running in a day. Yeah, I've I've had to rebuild a few machines for family and, and friends and stuff. And I hate doing it because it's, you know, I've got a local copy of some of the stuff like, you know, a copy of the antivirus software, the setup program. And, and the license of, number. Yeah, Well, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Programs that have license keys as well are a pain in the butt. I try not to use those. But, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. But it's not just the initial setup of a Windows machine that, that is painful compared to what we can do on Ubuntu. It's the ongoing maintenance. Like, I've got a Windows virtual machine that I use for managing my Drobo. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because you love freedom. Got so it, hang on. Got hang it on. in there. Hang on. You've got a dedicated 
virtual Windows machine just for managing your Drobo? No, I'm not that stupid. I also run Chromium in it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see you run a proprietary it's getting web getting better. <laughs> no, there's a few things. Like, you know, the um, Ethernet over power adapters, the little Devello things? Yeah. There's a Windows-based tool that lets you manage those. There's a win- uh, Linux-based tool I know as well. there is a Linux tool, but it's not. But he actually, the runs, he actually runs the Linux one under Windows using a Linux <laughs> emulator. Uh, do you perhaps run your Windows full screen? So you can't really sort of see the Linux that's underneath it or around it. <laughs> I use it in seamless mode. Oh, right. So, so, you so could... I actually have two toolbars, one for the Windows and one for Linux. But I don't, I don't boot my... This is the whole point I'm getting to, is I rarely boot it because I don't need to do any management on the driver yeah, because just, it manages he, itself. No, he, he just suspends and, it. He doesn't need to boot it. And I don't... And when I, but when I do wake up this Windows VM, all these pieces of software go, yeah, I need an update. Yeah. And Java and antivirus and their Microsoft thing. And Adobe Flash, Flash. that's Reader. always one that's Flash. coming up. And, and these things just annoy the hell out of me because I, I want to wake it up, do something, and then shut it down again. Yeah. And I don't care about all this stuff. I mean, okay, I might want to install updates, and that's fine, but I would rather do hit one icon, one yeah. button, and do them. And that So it's not just the initial install, it's the ongoing mm. maintenance that's, that's great. And so answering the original question, what I install is um, there's a package called Ubuntu Restricted Extras, which has uh, is a meta package, isn't it? It's got yeah, Java, yeah. Flash. Pulls in all the magic. Naughty Codex, you know, all the kind of <laughs> groovy stuff that make, like that. make your, yeah, bad man. And um, Gnome Do, which oh, yeah. I quite like. A lot of people starting. like Gnome Do, don't they? Gnome mm. Do is great. What's Gnome Do? Um, it's a launcher. Sits so on rather than finding applications on the menu... You press the Windows key and press space. And a Windows box. key. I'm miss sensing something here. I don't have one of those on here. Seriously, you don't have a Windows key. I don't have key a Windows laptop. key on my laptop. Well, you can map it to any other key. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> By default, it's a Windows key. So your Windows key space, and this box pops up, and then you can type like the first letter of an application, and it will find it. Like if I press S for Skype or T for Terminal or something like that, and there's loads of plugins for it. And Rather it than having to stuff. click the menu. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, I'm actually using the predecessor to that called Alt, Alt F2, F2, which basically yeah. I type Alt F2 and type S, and hey, you know, the thing with S will, st- will start... Like Skype. Yeah. Well, I'm using the predecessor to that, which is Control Alt F1, <laughs> log in, export display. <laughs> display <laughs> zero, Conan. You're not making yourself Geeks. look good. <laughs> Geeks. Oh, poor um, Tony. I also install a couple of media players, VLC and M player, for when Totem yeah, isn't good enough. Yeah, I quite like the way Totem prompts you and gives you the option. And yeah, you it just won't, you, it won't download W32 Codex. Really? No, it downloads a GStreamer Codex. Uh, and W32 Codex has stuff that GStreamer yeah. doesn't But I mean, I mean, as Laura was saying, you, if you try and open up an MP3 in Totem... It'll I'm say, not doing it in Totem, though. Yeah, but, oh, yeah, but we're just saying about this is another really good thing oh, I like I see, about Totem. Yeah. You know, you try and yeah. open up an MP3 in Totem and it'll say, hang on, you can't play this unless you install this. Do you want to install this? Mm. Yes, I do. So what would you recommend new users do then? Well, what would you what I, would you recommend you use? There, there's a tool I've had installed for quite a while, uh, Ubuntu Tweak, and uh, I think it's based off this sort of um, XP Tweak, Tweak UI, uh, uh, yeah, 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 the and, power uh, toy thing. Yeah, and it's actually it's it's, it's quite you know it's a slick, what does it do? slick interface. I mean, you can use it for changing like system information, like what the machine's called and things like that, but also um, for changing like your user shell, your user shell using because it's set to um, dash to start with. I, I always change it to bash. Yeah, when I when I asked what would end users do, I'm not convinced. <laughs> end user, I'm not convinced end user really cares what shell they're yeah, using. Yeah, they okay. Well, they shouldn't have to care. But yeah. so, is there anything in there that an end user might want? Um, yeah, you can set your documents folder through that. Uh, it's not that exciting to be honest. <laughs> You're not selling it well there, Dave. No, but you, I haven't really looked at it that much. To be so oh, it, templates. You can use it to set your templates. Uh, for like open so basically this tweak tweak thing actually sounds more like a front end to the gconf yeah, set of well, config things no, i'm sure it is it. Yeah. it sounds like a configuration yeah, I, thing. I think i don't think it's, I think it's more than gconf but yeah i'm sure a lot of settings are go do go to gconf but no what i mean is it's not a software install thing uh no it does have an add remove software thing oh it in does there as well. oh, okay cool what would be really cool is if uh our listeners could tell us what they do yeah. post install <laughs> Or tell us if they know of any scripts or funky stuff. Don't tell us about automatics or well, automatics, yeah. but something else. Something that's and, and, really good. And the prize for this, we won't be sending you something out, but you will get the envy of your friends by getting your voice, you know, by getting your message on the podcast. Yeah, that's something a lot of people aspire to, I'm sure. Uh, they really, really want that. They lay in bed wanting. You can tell that by the number of people that leave us <laughs> voice mail. <laughs> yeah. How many is it? Two? I think it might be three. Yeah, one of those, oh, no, one one of those is you. a personal call for days. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> But no, seriously, chaps, 
send us emails because we love to read them. We do read every email and um, I think it'd be really nice for us to get a list of what you guys do. Yeah, send it to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Okay, we had quite a few emails pointing out that the Debian link on the podcast website from the last episode actually links to Ubuntu.com. Yeah, one of the people who pointed it out was Phil Hans from the Debian project who we interviewed last time. Yeah, and the reason it does this is because it's Alan's idea of a joke. I did run it past you guys and you said, yes, that would be funny. Um, I don't think I, don't I did think that. I knew, no. I think these are the oh, voices actually, no, in head. that no, it I, I no. Actually, I asked some <laughs> yeah. other people, and they said it was fine. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. You know, you're right. Decided not to ask your co-presenters. Maybe the listeners could write in and let us know if they find it amusing. Mm, yes, everybody. Especially, it funny. If you, especially if you use you, that Debian r- derivative. Yes. You could actually write that down and put that in a cracker for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> we had a mail from Javier, I think. Can we have more desktop-oriented segments? Liked the backup one. Would like other stuff like office suites, graphic creation, so Inkscape, OpenOffice, that kind of stuff, scientific software, desktop search engines, that kind of jazz. Sounds a good idea. Yeah, I think we could certainly cover more of that in the future. I guess the problem is that most most of us actually don't use much in the way of desktop software. I mean, I, I spend most of my day in a browser or in a terminal. I yep. Yep. use some, but I don't try different things i just stick with the one yeah ch- change is dangerous maybe we need to set ourselves a mission of using <gasps> k office for a couple of hey weeks. easy easy tony well daryl sent us an email about remote support he said he successfully run cross loop and team viewer on a hardy desktop using wine he says he's able to view desktops of other people but they can't view his desktop so you can run the client but you can't run the server but it'd be great to have something like cross loop in your bunch by default so that they could help him or vice versa. I mean, we we talked about this in when we did the remote support one. When we talked about Gitso and another remote support, BNC, BNC, yeah, all the other bunch. Yeah. yeah, it would be good. I mean, it, I think they need to work on uh, Gitso a bit, but I think that would be a great one to put in there. Yeah, Mish mentioned uh, Copilot, and Drew DeConning mentioned Hamachi. Hamachi is well. a bit different. That's a, a VPN kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very simple VPN. You can have a VPN in minutes. Well, allegedly. Yeah, it does work. Really. But you actually, you're VPNing into, you, you're turning up on someone else's server. Adam Sweet of Passion Star fame um, emailed about the backup segment. He just says to us, Hi guys and girls, I just thought I'd offer some sage advice regarding backups. <clears throat> I better stop that voice now. Everybody goes on about backups, but they don't matter in the slightest so long as you're doing them. What everybody ought to care about is restoring. Backups are useless without restoration. He has a friend who we all know, but who shall remain nameless. And then he actually says, no, it wasn't Jono, um, who set up home user backup from the Ubuntu, rep- Ubuntu repositories, left it backing up his stuff and forgot about it. Six months down the line, couldn't work out why his massive hard disk was nearly full. On looking, he found that an- there was an enormous archive of backups he'd forgotten about. I was rather pleased that it had been working all the time. Um, however, the first time he needed to restore something and home user backup couldn't actually read its own backup archives, he was less than impressed. So the, the moral of the story is test that the backups actually work in the way you expected them to and that you can restore from them, otherwise they're useless. He says, it sounds like a fun pack show, BBC Radio 4, eat your heart out. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, it's the salient lesson to learn, isn't it? Backups are only only good if you can get stuff back out of them. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder how Axe sorted that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I have to tell you, I, uh, many years ago when I used to do IT support, I did some support for a, a local company, and they used to back up every day at 5 o'clock. They'd walk out the door, put a tape in the, in the drive in the PC, and walk out, and um, they'd leave it running overnight, and then the next day it was all finished. I went there because they needed to restore a file. So I asked them to get the tape out, and it was all nicely labeled, and I put it in, and I started the restore using this DOS-based uh, backup software. And it said zero files restored. I thought that was a bit strange. So I thought using wildcards or I explicitly mentioned the whole path or whatever it was. And I couldn't get any files off this tape. And eventually I rummaged around looking at the configuration of the backup software. And it was actually backing up the wrong folder. It was backing up an empty directory. So every single day they were backing up nothing to the tape. It was just enough to like spin the tape up and wind it backwards or forwards and write a log file. And they'd never actually backed anything up ever. So I reconfigured it so that it backed up correctly. And within a couple of days... We had a phone call from them telling us that the backup was running too slowly. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's because it's actually backing up now. <laughs> we also had an email from Sam on the subject of backups. Um, Laura mentioned Pi Backup um, in episode 16. And Sam says they can't find it. 
Uh, has it been removed? And actually, the answer is no. Uh, Laura got the name wrong. It's called Pi Backpack. Is all it one word. Sack? Yeah, P Y Backpack. All one word. Laura's mistake. Sorry, and Sam. A, and it's actually a member of the uh, UK Ubuntu community that's uh, done that, isn't it? Is it? Andrew Price from the uh, Ubuntu UK community. Cool. Oh, okay. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986 and make Davey happy. You can uh, follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash UUPC or on identica, identi.ca slash UUPC. Join us on Facebook, search for the Ubuntu UK podcast. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenode IRC network. We welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews or rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please get in touch. Thanks also to our network of mirrors who make it possible for us to bring the show to you, including Bitfolk and our other community mirrors hosted by Nafalo and Martin Meredith. Yep, and those mirrors have helped us serve out over 160,000 downloads since we started My wow. 17 episodes ago. So thank you for downloading, and if you're a new listener, you can go to the website and download the entire archive. Thanks for listening. Join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.